Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering NCLEX topics. And guys, these same coverings, uh, the same topics I'm going to be covering will also help you if you're taking a midterm or a final that is cumulative, such as your ATI or HESI, they will also help you, okay guys? If you haven't done so already, you know what I'm gonna ask you to do next. Please do not forget to like and subscribe below. Don't forget to check out my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Um, on there, I have audio lessons for students that are currently in the program that need that extra push. You need, you know, just that focus on what is most likely going to be on your test, right? Check me out on nexusnursinginstitute.com. If you're studying for your boards, but you need help on a specific topic, guys, I have plenty of audio lessons available as well as mine. Tumblr, guys. Check out my Tumblr. I have that on my website as well. And of course, I'm streaming on every major platform with my um, podcast for RNs and nurse practitioner students. So guys, check me out. Next is nursing. Okay, guys, without any further ado, let's get started. First question. The home health nurse notes the 88-year-old female client is unable to cook for herself and mainly eats frozen foods and sandwiches. Which intervention should the nurse implement? One, discuss the situation with the client's family. Two, refer the client to the home health occupational therapist. Three, request a home health aide cook all the client's meals. Or four, contact the community's Meals on Wheels. And guys, the correct answer will be for contact the community's Meals on Wheels. Why? Because Meals on Wheels, they deliver, and this is your key word, hot, hot and nutritious uh, foods for patients that are unable to care for themselves, such as making foods or getting out to get the right type of foods. They will actually deliver it. And look at in the question, you see that it says that the patient's eating what? Mainly frozen foods and sandwiches. They're not getting you know, hot foods and the foods aren't real, really nutritious. So the best thing for that nurse to do is to contact Meals on Wheels. Now, when the nurse contacts Meals on Wheels, something else that it does for this patient, it allows this patient to hold on to their what? Independence, their autonomy, right? So if choice four was not an answer, then you could have went with one, right? But when you go with one, you know, reaching out to the family, number one, when you're reaching out to the family, that patient is going to be dependent on the family to give them warm and nutritious meals. That's number one. And so we're taking away, you know, their autonomy. We're taking away their uh, uh, independence. And number two, don't you think the family would have gotten involved already if they wanted to? So if choice uh, four, the Meals on Wheels wasn't there, your next choice would have been the family. But because Meals on Wheels is there and with Meals on Wheels, the patient will still be able to be independent. That's why we're going with Meals on Wheels, okay? That is a wonderful resource for the elderly patients that can't cook for themselves or maybe debilitate or can't get out. All right, now let's look at our other choices. Choice number two, refer the client to home health occupational therapist. Okay, you guys tend to get confused between occupational therapists and physical therapists. So occupational therapists, they are more for the patient's upper body. So upper body strength to use their arms, their hands. Physical therapist is more for the lower body using their legs and their feet. That has nothing to do with meals, nothing to do with nutrition, so that's wrong. Choice three, have the home health aide cook all the meals. Uh, no, the home health aide is not there to cook for the patient. They're there to help the patient with the ADLs, brush your teeth, comb their hair, you know, very light things, not cooking or cleaning. Next question. Which legal intervention should the nurse implement on the initial visit when admitting a client to the home health care agency? One, discuss professional boundary crossing policy with the client. Two, provide the client with a copy of NAHC Bill of Rights. Three, tell the client how many visits the client will have while on service. Or four, explain that the client must be homebound to be eligible for home, for home health care. And guys, the correct answer is to provide the client with the Bill of Rights. So guys, just like, you know, any facility, hospital, nurse, nursing home, skilled care, long-term care, the Bill of Rights has to be placed in an area that um, is visible, right? 
Same thing with home health, except with home health, you're not going to place it in patient's home, but you absolutely legally, you are responsible to discuss the patient's bill of rights. Let them know what their rights are. And if their rights are being infringed upon the contact, the number that they need to call legally as a home health nurse, you are responsible for doing that. Now let's talk about the other choices. Choice one, discussing professional boundary crossing policy with the client. No, you are not legally bound to talk to the patient about that. You need to know what the policy for your facility is. So if you know it's crossing a boundary to date, a, a, um, um, offspring of a patient, that's your responsibility as a nurse to know what those boundaries are and not to cross it. You're not legally obligated to discuss that with the patient. It's just your responsibility to know what those boundaries are and not to cross them. Choice uh, three, tell the client how many visits the client will have on service. Um, that's something that you should do. That's something that I'm sure is going to be a policy of every single home health agency, but you're not legally bound to do that. Choice four, explain that the client must be homebound to be eligible for, for home health care. Although this is a law. The patient actually must be homebound in order to be eligible for home health. This is absolutely true. You're not legally bound to teach that to the, the client. That's something that the home health agency and the physician takes care of. They make sure that the patient is um, homebound before the doctor will write the order for home health, right? So legally, even though this is true that the patient must be homebound to get home health, you're not legally bound to discuss that with the client, but you are legally bound to discuss their bill of rights and the contact information if um, their rights are being stomped upon. Okay, next question. The unlicensed assistive personnel accidentally pulled the client's chest tube out while assisting the client to the bedside commode. Which intervention should the nurse implement first? One, secure petroleum gauze over the insertion site. Two, instruct the UAP how to move client for a client with a chest tube. Three, assess the client's respirations and lung sounds. Or four, obtain a chest tube and chest tube insertion tray. And guys, the correct answer is number one, securely tape petroleum uh, gauze over the insertion site. And the reason you're doing this, you wanna keep air from entering that pleural space. So that is the first thing you're going to do. Remember, guys, safety, safety, safety. So that's the first thing you're going to do. Um, choice two, instruct the UAP how to move client with a chest tube. Well, you should have done that before the, client, the UAP was caring for the client and moving the client, right? And if this happens, you're going to do this again. Down the road, you know, the UAP will get uh, remediation and you'll teach them all that good stuff, but that's not going to be a priority. Patient safety is priority at the moment. Choice three, assess the client's respirations and lung sounds. You're actually going to do this right after, right after you place that petroleum gauze over the insertion site to keep uh, air from entering the pleural space. After you do that, then the very next thing you're gonna do is assess the patient. You're gonna listen to the lung sounds. You're gonna take the patient's vitals. You're gonna check the respirations. And choice four, obtain a chest tube and chest tube insertion tray. After you've placed the petroleum jelly, after you've assessed the patient, after you've called the doctor and you've given the doctor your findings because you've assessed the patient, then you're going to do number four to help the doctor uh, prepare to insert the new chest tube. Okay, next question. The, nurses, the nurse and LPN have been assigned to care for clients on the P's unit. Which nursing task should be assessed, should be assigned to the LPN? One, administer PO medications to a client diagnosed with gastroenteritis. Two, Take the routine vital signs for all clients in the pediatric unit. Three, transcribe the healthcare provider's orders on the computer. Or four, assess the urinary output of a client diagnosed with nephrotic syndrome. And guys, the correct answer is number one. Administer PO medications to a client diagnosed with gastroenteritis. Remember, when it comes to the LPN, you're going to give them the most stable patient. You're going to give them the patient that has a routine meds. You're going to give the patient that there's nothing acutely going on with it. Now, if you guys have been following my channel for some time, you guys know there was drama last week that I was accused of, you know, being biased and looking down on LPNs and all that good stuff. 
Um, guys, I'm teaching you for the boards. I'm teaching you for testing purposes, not what happens in real life, okay? So when I say you're going to give the LPN the most stable patient, the one with the routine meds, I'm not saying it in a derogatory way or I'm looking down on the LPNs. That's just what it is for testing purposes. If you want to pass your exam, you're going to listen to me. All right. So that's the correct answer. Now let's look at our other choices. Two, routine, uh, take the routine vitals for all clients on the PEDS unit. Look how they tried to trick you because they put that word routine, right? And we know things that are routine, we give to the LPN because we want to give the LPN the most stable patient. But keep looking, it said routine vitals for who? The PEDS on the unit and their routine vitals. Guess what? UAP, CNAs can take vitals. We don't need that LPN to take vitals when we can use the LPN to give medications to a patient, right? UAPs, unlicensed assistive personnel, they can take vital signs, they can do INOs, they can even check glucose, they can record and report, they can pick up medication from the pharmacy and bring it to you, they can transfer equipment, they can help patients with ADLs. UAPs can do a lot of things and this is one of the things that UAPs can do. So we're going to use a UAP for that, not the LPN. Choice three, transcribe the healthcare provider's order on the computer. Who transcribes orders? The medical secretary, right? We're not going to give that to the LPN. And choice four, assess. Let's stop right there. Assess. Who does our assessments? The RN. The RN. And guys, I say this not meaning LPNs don't do assessments because before LPN does an intervention for a patient, don't they assess their patient? Absolutely. What I'm saying is if you have a choice, the RN is going to do the assessment every single time okay so um the correct answer is going to be number one because that is the most stable patient the hospital will be implementing a new medication administration a record for documentation for documenting medication administration which action should the clinical manager take when implementing the new mar so this is a nurse leadership question guys one discuss the new MAR with each nurse individually. Two, schedule meetings on all shifts to discuss the new MAR. Three, excuse me guys. Three, require the nurse to read a handout explaining the new MAR. Or four, ask new, excuse me, ask nurses to watch a video explaining the new MAR. And the correct answer is gonna be two. You're gonna schedule meetings on each shift on each shift to discuss the new MAR. Why? This is most efficient, guys. So you're gonna get in contact with all the nurses, explain this new MAR, and allow opportunities for questions. If the nurses have any questions, you'll be there to answer their questions and clarify anything that may not be clear. Now let's look at the other choices. One, discuss the new MAR with each, with each nurse individually. Absolutely not, that's not efficient at all, okay? You're gonna do it for each shift. Now, if a nurse, and still having a problem with the, with the system, then by all means, you'll meet with the nurse individually to review what was already taught, okay? Um, choice three and four, giving a handout or having them watch a video, that's not efficient, okay? Now the handout and video, you can do afterwards. You can do that as a supplement to your teaching, but initially you wanna meet with the nurses, explain to them what's going on, offer yourself to you know provide any clarification or an answer any questions and everything else can be follow up which client warrants immediate intervention from the nurse on the medical unit one the client diagnosed with abdominal aortic aneurysm who has an auto audible brewery two the clients with adult respiratory distress syndrome who has bilateral crackles Three, the client diagnosed with bacterial meningitis who has mucal rigidity and neck pain. Or four, the client with Crohn's disease who has right lower abdominal pain and has diarrhea. And guys, the correct answer is for the client with Crohn's that has abdominal pain and diarrhea. I hope you guys notice something. Choices one, two, and three, the wrong choices, those signs and symptoms are expected findings in the disease or disorder. So yes, that patient needs to be assessed, but they're not a priority. We expect to see those things with those disorders. The patient that has um, the abdominal aortic, abdominal aortic aneurysm, we expect to uh, fill a brewery. The patient that has ARDS, we expect for them to have bilateral crackles. That patient has been diagnosed with meningitis, nuchal rigidity, neck pain. Those are signs and symptoms of meningitis. We expect to see that. Look at choice four, the patient with Crohn's. Now, you know, patients with Crohn's, they may have diarrhea. We expect that, but not pain. 
Absolutely not. Pain is not a sign or symptom of Crohn's. If that patient has pain, you better suspect some kind of complication such as what? perforation, which is a medical emergency. So you need to be assessing that patient first because we don't expect to see that sign and symptom with that disorder, okay? Which assessment data warrants immediate intervention by the nurse for the client diagnosed with chronic kidney disease who's on peritoneal dialysis? One, the client's from creatinine levels 2.4. Two, the client's abdomen is soft to touch and non-tender. Three, the dialysis being removed from the abdomen is cloudy or for the dial dialysis and you guys know I cannot speak. The dialysis instilled was 1500 milliliters and removed was 2100 milliliters. So guys, the correct answer is three. The dialysis being removed from the abdomen is cloudy. Is it ever supposed to be cloudy? Absolutely not. It's supposed to be clear or straw colored. If it's cloudy, what does that tell you? Most likely it's happening, infection, okay? So that's the patient you're going to be going to first. Now let's look at our other choices. You have choice one, the client serum creatinine level, that's 2.4, okay. Normal serum creatinine is about 0 0.7 to 1.8. So 2.4 is elevated, but they got chronic kidney disease. Hello? So we expect the creatinine to be elevated. It's elevated because of the patient's disorder. So there's nothing, you know, in this to make us run to this patient, right? Choice two, the abdomen soft and non-tender. Well, that's good. That's what we want it to be. If that abdomen was hard, it was rigid, it was tender, it was painful, uh-oh, that's where we would be concerned, right? We'd be thinking possibly what? Peritonitis. Okay, but the fact that it's soft and non-tender, that's a good thing. There's no reason to be rushing to that patient first. And choice three, uh, 1,500 mLs was instilled and uh, 2,100 was removed. That's good. We always want to remove more than what we put into the patient. They're getting dialysis. That is the whole point. So that we're removing more than um, we're instilling into the patient, that lets us know that this dialysis is being um, effective. Okay, guys, next question. The nurse is working at the county hospital and is admitting a client who's RH negative to the labor and delivery unit. The client's gravity two, para zero. Which assessment data is most important for the nurse to assess? One, why the client did not have a viably, viable baby the first pregnancy. Two, if the mother received real gam injection after the last pregnancy. Three, the period of time between the client's pregnancies. Or four, when the mother terminated the previous pregnancy. And guys, the correct answer is too, if the mother received a Rogam injection after the last pregnancy. They told us that mom is RH negative for a reason, guys. If you watch my other videos to, um, before, by the way, if you're taking maternity or OB right now, I have a whole playlist of OB um, videos. Make sure you guys catch that. But if you guys have been following my videos on this, you know I make it very clear. If... In the question, they tell you that mom is RH negative. They're telling you this for a reason. If mom is RH negative, you need to be concerned about Rogan because we don't know if mom was cheating on husband and that baby might be RH positive, right? We don't know that, so we're concerned. Mom is gravity too. She's had two pregnancies, no viable babies, no live babies, right? So what are we concerned about? We need to make sure that she's got that Rogan within 72 hours of the loss of that previous baby. Why? Guys, we are concerned with erythroblastosis, the blue baby. We don't want that to happen to this pregnancy. So that's why we're asking this question. That's why that's our concern. All of this, why, you know, the baby wasn't viable and time between, between pregnancies, all that. We don't care about that. If she's RH negative, we care about Rogam. That is our concern. Okay, guys, next question. The unconscious four-year-old child with bruises covering the torso in varying stages of healing is brought to the emergency department by paramedics. The nurse notes small burn marks on the child's genitalia. Which action should the nurse implement? Select all that applies. Okay, guys, how do we treat select all that applies? As true or false. Don't forget, you're going to read each answer choice. If it's true, you're going to keep it. If it's false, you throw it out. Don't try to group the choices together because as students, that's what you tend to do and that's why you get them wrong. 
it has to answer the question by itself without grouping them together. So let's go. One, notify Child Protective Services. Absolutely. Why? Because we, we suspect child abuse. Two, ask the parent how the child was injured. Absolutely not. This is a child. You think they're abusing themselves? No. Who's most likely abusing this child? The parents. Or if it's not the parents, the parents know who's doing it, right? So do we ever ask an abuser, somebody we suspect that's abusing a woman, do we ever ask the suspected abuser how the, the, how the um, victim got their injuries? No. So you're not going to ask the parents how the child got the injuries. Absolutely not. That's false. When you ask the parent that, you're going to make them suspicious. They might grab their kid and go, right? And not only might they grab their kid and go, you are not, you know, a forensics nurse. You know, you asking those parents questions, it really might mess up the prosecution down the line if this has to go to court. You're not trained for that. You don't ask those parents questions about the injuries. Your job is to contact your supervisor, your supervisor, um, We'll contact protective services. Obviously here, there's not that choice. So you'd be the one to contact child protective services. But the point is to that you understand that the authorities need to be called and you are not going to ask the parents about the child's injuries, how it suspect, how it happened. Choice three, perform a thorough examination for more injuries. Absolutely. You're going to um, check that uh, patient from head to toe. And when you document, you cannot document any uh, opinions. Because your documentation most likely is going to be part of the record when it goes to trial, right? So you're going to be very factual in your documentation. Your Everything you observe is going to be objective, okay? Um, four, tell the parents that the police have been called. Absolutely not. Just like in the situation of abuse, do we tell the suspected abuser, oh, I just called the police. They'll be here any minute. No. So you're not going to tell the parents that the police have been called. Uh, choice four, prepare the child for a uh, skull, x-rays, and CT scan. Absolutely. Why? You want to assess for the extent of injury. Now, of course, the physician's going to order these tests, but you expect it to be ordered. You're going to assess for the extent of injury. Okay. Next question. The 24-month-old toddler is admitted to the pediatric unit with vomiting and diarrhea. Which intervention should the nurse implement? Rank in order of performance. Okay, so we're going to use all of, this all of the choices, but we're going to rank them in order of performance. So here are choices. One, teach the parent about weighing the diapers to determine output status. Two, show the parent the call light and explain safety regimens. Three, assess toddler's tissue turgor. Four, place appropriate size diapers in the room or five and five, take the toddler's vital signs. So we're going to use all of those. So we have a two-year-old that has vomiting and diarrhea. So that tells us we have a very small body that is losing fluids. So we're concerned with what? Dehydration. And the smaller the body is, the higher risk that patient has for dying from dehydration, right? So let's look at our choices. They're in front of us. The very first thing you're gonna do, guys, assess, assess, assess. And we have a couple assessment question uh, choices. Remember what comes first, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, physiological integrity, what keeps the patient alive? Vital signs, um, airway breathing, circulation, hemodynamic status, uh, fluid and electrolytes, glucose, nutrition, right? All of those that fall in, under physiological integrity and Maslow's hierarchy of needs are always going to come first. So the first thing you're going to do is vital signs, number five. That is the first thing you're going to do, vital signs. What's the next thing you're going to do? Remember ADPI, again, we're going to assess, but we have a couple assessment choices. So what's going to be next? Next is going to be number three, assess the skin turgor. Why? I just told you the patient has nausea and vomiting and they're a very small body. What are we concerned about? Dehydration. So we're going to assess skin turgor. That's the very next thing we're going to do. After that, choice number, what's the uh, third thing we're going to do? Choice number two, show the parent call light and explain safety regimens. Why? You have to show the parents to call light and teach them not to leave that patient alone. If you have to go, press that call light, let us know, and somebody else will come into that patient's room. We can't have this child alone. 
safety precautions. Safety is very important. So you're going to teach those parents that. Next, um, number four, you're going to put the right size diaper in the patient's room. Patient has what? Diarrhea. So that patient has to be changed very often. Why? Because we're concerned about skin breakdown. And lastly, you're going to teach a patient about weighing the diapers. Remember, these are peds patients we're, we're talking about. So we're going to weigh those diapers before and after so, um, the diaper soiled so we can keep track of, track of what? I and O. Okay? Next question. The nurse has received the shift report. Which client should the nurse assess first? One, the client diagnosed with DVT who complains of feeling of doom. Two, client diagnosed with gallbladder ulcer disease who refuses to eat food served. Three, the client diagnosed with pancreatitis who wants NG2 removed. Or four, client diagnosed with osteoarthritis who's complaining of stiff joints. And guys, by far, by far, the patient you're going to see first is number one. So here we have a patient with deep vein thrombosis. They're complaining a feeling of doom. What do you suspect? You better suspect pulmonary embolism. You better suspect that that DVT has traveled and now went where? To the patient's lungs. Because that feeling of doom is a sign and symptom of a pulmonary embolism. Okay? What are other signs of pulmonary embolism? Patient will have shortness of breath. They'll have difficulty uh, breathing. They'll have cough. And they'll feel like they're about to die. That feeling of doom is a feeling that they're about to die. They're so afraid. Okay? That's the patient you better be running to. Um, choices two, three, and four. Yes, these patients need to be assessed, but they're not life-threatening. But number one, that absolutely is life-threatening. That patient has a DVT and all of a sudden they feel like they're about to die. You better suspect pulmonary embolism. You better suspect that that clot has moved and has now lodged itself into the patient's lungs. Next question. The home health nurse is planning his rounds for the day. Which client should the nurse see first? One, the 56-year-old client diagnosed with multiple sclerosis who's complaining of a cough. Two, 78-year-old client diagnosed with congestive heart failure who reports losing three pounds. Three, 42-year-old client diagnosed with a L5 spinal cord injury who developed a stage four pressure ulcer. Or four, an 80-year-old client diagnosed with CVA who has right-sided paralysis. And guys, remember, whenever you get a question about who you're going to see first, what they're really asking you is, who is at most risk for dying the quickest? Who's going to die the soonest? Who is most danger of dying? And in this situation, it's one. The 56-year-old client uh, diagnosed with multiple sclerosis complaining of what? A cough. Now think about it, guys. Multiple sclerosis, this patient has extreme fatigue. They're not doing what? Moving. What is a big complication of immobility? Pneumonia. This is the patient we're going to be running to because we're suspecting this patient now has a complication of the multiple sclerosis. And we're concerned about pneumonia. We're concerned about airway. That's the patient you're running to because that's the patient who will most likely die on you the quickest. Okay. Let's go over the other answer choices. You had two, the client with CHF that report losing three pounds. Good. We want them to lose weight. We want them to, what kind of weight? Three pounds. What, where do you think those pounds came from? Fluid. So we're trying to get rid of fluids. That is wonderful. That's a good thing. We don't need to be running to them. Choice three, the patient with an L5 that develop a pressure ulcer. And, you know, a pressure ulcers, those are complications of patients who are paralyzed or not moving. So, yes, that patient needs to be assessed. The situation needs to be addressed, but it's not life-threatening like that patient that has a cough with multiple sclerosis. Choice four, patient with a CVA that has right side paralysis. That's expected finding with a stroke. A patient has a stroke, you expect them to have um, one-sided weakness or paralysis. Yes, they still need to be assessed, but their life is not in danger, such as that multiple sclerosis patient who has now a what? A cough. Did I finish all my questions already? <sighs> oh, no. Okay. I can't believe my time's almost up. Okay, guys. The nurse is preparing to perform a sterile dressing change on a client with full thickness burns on the right leg. Which intervention should the nurse implement first? One, pre-medicate the client with narcotic analgesic. 
Two, prepare the equipment and bandages at the bedside. Three, remove, remove the old dressing with non-sterile gloves. Or four, place a sterile glove on the dominant hand. And the correct answer is one, pre-medicate the client with a narcotic analgesic. Guys, if you've been following me for any amount of time, I've said this over and over and over again. Pain is never a priority except in four situations. Burns, stones, and when I say stones, it could be calcium stones, struvi, gallbladder. Patient has stones, pain's a priority. Myocard infarction, heart attack. And the fourth one was my fourth one, sickle cell. In these four situations, pain needs to be right down there in physiological integrity, such as your vital signs, your ABC, your hemodynamic status, your nutrition, your fluid and electrolytes, your glucose, all of those. Pain takes precedence with those in those four situations. Burns, stones, sickle cell, and myocardial infarction. Okay, in those situations, uh, pain is a priority. Next question. The physical therapist has notified the unit secretary that the client will be ambulated in 45 minutes. After receiving notification from the unit secretary, which task should the charge nurse delegate to the UAP? One, administer pain medication 30 minutes before therapy. Two, give the client a washcloth to wash his or her face before walking. Three, make sure the client has been offered the use of the bathroom. Or four, find a walker that is at the correct height for the client to use. And the correct answer is three, make sure they've used the bathroom so that in 30 minutes when the physical therapist comes or is it, yeah, when the physical therapist gets there, they can get, the patient can get the full amount of therapy and time is not wasted. Okay. Let's look at our wrong answer choices. One, give medication. UAPs cannot give medications. Unlicensed professionals cannot give medications. Two, washcloth. You're going to have the patient wash their face before what? Eating not walking. So the UAP would give that patient the washcloth before they eat the meal, not before ambulation. And choice four, finding the correct height for the patient, the, of the, you know, the correct height of the walker, that's going to be the job of the physical therapist, not the UAP, okay? All right, guys, we are down to our last question. The nurse is preparing to administer the client's first IV antibiotic. Prioritize the client's actions from first to last. So we're going to use all of these choices. One, check the healthcare provider's order in the chart. Two, determine if the client has any known allergies. Three, hang the secondary IV piggyback higher than the primary IV. Uh, four, set the IV pump at the correct rate. Five, determine if the antibiotic is compatible with primary IV. So here is um, the order in which we're going to do this. The first thing you're going to do is what? Assess. Remember guys, I told you, an assessment is not only a physical exam of the patient. An assessment is anything you do to gather information. So it can be asking the patient a question. It can be going into the chart to get information, physical exam, anything that garners information. So the first thing you're going to do is number one, you better check that um, the the order it and make sure that the doctor wrote an order for that medication. That is the first thing you're going to do. Make sure that there's an order. The next thing you're going to do is number five, determine if the antibiotic is compatible with the primary IV. So you're going to double check. And remember guys, whenever you have a question about a medication, you only have two choices. And one of them is not the doctor. Your two choices is your drug book or the pharmacist. So you're either going to check your drug book or the pharmacist to make sure that this antibiotic is compatible with the primary IV, not the physician. Okay. So you're going to do number one, check the healthcare provider's order in the chart. Make sure you have the order. Make sure that order is correct. Then you're going to do number five and you're going to check either the pharmacist or your drug book to make sure it's compatible. Then you're going to do number two, determine if the client has any known allergies. I want you to know this. Number one, number five, number two, all of these are what? Assessments. Remember ADPI, Assessment, Diagnosis, Planning, Intervention, Evaluation. You have to always assess first. Notice that the first three things that you're doing is assessing. You're gathering information, okay? Remember, you have to always assess before you can intervene. 
All right, so we did number one, we did number five, we did number two. The next thing you're gonna do is number three, you're gonna hang the IV piggyback higher than your primary IV, that's your intervention. And then lastly, guys, you're gonna do number four. You're gonna set the IV pump at the correct rate, which is also an intervention. And in that order, guys, I hope you found this video to be helpful. I promise I'm going to keep more and collects videos coming because I can't even tell you how many of you guys have emailed me or commented saying, you know, you're studying for your boards and these are so helpful. I promise I'm going to keep them coming. But th if there's another subject you'd like to see me cover, please let me know. I have a list of them. I'll add it to the list if it's not already there. I promise though I'm going to keep those videos coming, guys. Please don't forget, I'm now on TikTok. I'm on Instagram and I'm on Facebook. You can look me up, Nexus Nursing. Make sure you guys check that out. And don't forget to check out my podcast, Nexus Nursing, as well as my website, www.nexusnursinginstitute.com. Thank you so much for watching this video, guys. Please do not forget to like and subscribe below. And you'll see me on the next video.